Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. Um, before I turn it over to Cindy, who will do her usual author talk introduction, um, I just want to go over a couple housekeeping items related to uh, how GoToWebinar works. So, um, on this slide, this is what the GoToWebinar dashboard should look like for you. Um, if you do not see this dashboard, uh, look for this orange box with a white arrow. Um, that'll open and close the dashboard. So it may be either at the top left or right hand side of your screen. Um, if you have any problems and can't figure how to do anything, uh, just hit this raise hand button here um, and I will get in contact with you directly and hopefully uh, work out any issues that you are having. Um, there are some handouts for today. So under the handouts section here, um, you would be able to download the two handouts that we have for you. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the program, but if you would like to submit them during it, you're more than welcome to. And you can just write it here in this question feature and send it to me. Um, and again, we'll answer it at the end. Um, if it's a technical question or something that you're having problems with, I can work with you during the presentation to hopefully resolve that. Um, and one last thing, there will be two polls that will be launched during this presentation. Um, if you can please answer them and then we'll share the results and that'll really help John out in making this a great presentation. So uh, without further ado, Cindy, you can take it away. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I wanna welcome everybody to our first virtual author talk. Of course, it is a webinar, but we like calling it a virtual author talk and we're, uh, you know, learning to do things differently in this COVID-19 time. I'm thankful that our author agreed to be with us virtually and uh, his book, I wanted to let you know, is available, of course, at the State Library in our collection. But also, uh, if you wanted to go to IndieBound.org, there's a bookstore finder there and we could, you could help local businesses. It'll give you a local bookstore that's near you and then you can click on that and see if they have his book. I did it with uh, different ones in New Jersey and most of them had his book so you could also go that way so you can support your local businesses. I would encourage you to bliz blizzard, visit our website. We have a lot of great webinars that are upcoming. I'm still working on rescheduling a lot of our planned author talks so stay tuned through our newsletter or website to find what's coming up there. Now I'm gonna turn the rest of the time over to our author, John Hall, once I give you a little background on him. And he of course can give you more because he's John. Uh, he's a New Jersey native who searched the 21 counties to find the best recipes that New Jersey has to offer. And the recipes in the book celebrate the foods, flavors, cultures, and traditions of the Garden State. Dishes included feature New Jersey's own produce, tomatoes, corn, cranberries, blueberries, apples, along with deep fried boardwalk treats, diner bites, and recipes contributed by casinos, bison and dairy farms, food trucks, old school delis, yum, famous bakeries, and more. Recipes in the book include pork roll surprise, funnel cake at home, tomato and onion salad, Jersey green clam chowder, and more. And you've got two of the recipes there in the handouts. The book highlights the state's melting pot with Italian, Puerto Rican, Polish, Chinese, and Indian dishes included. And there's a focus on local produce. John was born in Teaneck and he was raised in South Orange. And he's an award-winning journalist covering the beer industry. He's the author of several books in addition to Dishing Up New Jersey. The titles include Drink Beer, Think Beer, Getting to the Bottom of Every Pint, and The American Craft Beer Cookbook. He is a contributing editor for the Wine Enthusiast magazine and the co-host of Steal This Beer, which is a podcast. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Wine Enthusiast, and more. John has lectured on the culture and history of beer and judged beer competitions around the world. And now we're looking forward to see what he has for us today. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, it's it's great to be here and and as you mentioned a, a little bit weird in this covid age to uh, be giving a, a virtual talk uh, i i love the opportunity to come out to libraries and to bookstores and and 
breweries and bars uh, to, to talk with people because it's so much easier uh, to interact with a crowd when there's actually people in the room as opposed to sitting in a, uh, a guest bedroom at a house that we're staying at right now. So um, bear with me as I, I try to figure out my way through this as well, but I, I'm really appreciative, uh, appreciative of the State Library and all that um, uh, you've been doing and your support of authors uh, in the state and, and, and the work that we're, that we're trying to do. Um, I will point out that there is that questions button on there. Usually, uh, if questions come in as I'm giving presentations, I'm happy to answer them in real time. I think it, it leads to a little bit more of a fun, lively conversation, so it's not just people sitting in chairs. So uh, if, if folks have questions about Jersey food, uh, Cindy also mentioned that I cover the beer industry. If you have beer-related questions, I'm happy to answer those, and uh, we can either answer them at the end or we can answer them as they come through, but please don't be shy. This, this should be a collaborative effort. So I've lived in Jersey for most of my life. Uh, I've worked in Jersey for most of my life. And it was when I was 16 years old that I got hired as a summer intern at New Jersey Network News. And NJN had been around forever, and it was a, uh, a great and wonderful state resource until Chris Christie and his infinite wisdom decided that the state didn't need uh, an independent public television station. Um, but that newscast that they had every night, and I, I hope a lot of you remember, Kent Manahan was, was the anchor, and there's great reporters like Jim Hooker, uh, who was there, and Michael Aaron, who's still around. Um, uh, I was a young kid who wanted to be in the news industry, and NJN gave me a shot when I was a junior in high school. And almost immediately, as part of this internship, I was sent out into the field. Uh, which was a, a strange thing and doesn't happen at other television stations, but such was the beauty of NJN. And almost uh, from day one, if we were covering breaking news or we were going to uh, you know, cover a, a press conference for a politician or for a, a prosecutor's office or, or whatever we were doing, um, I would be with we had a, a photographer and a real reporter uh, and a sound engineer. And wherever we were in the state, they knew where the best restaurant was. And sometimes it was a takeaway place and sometimes it was uh, an actual sit down restaurant. And sometimes it was just a food truck or a taco cart or something like that. But these guys have been covering the state for so long and they were in the field so much that they realized uh, one of the benefits of being out on the road was being able to eat local. And so very quickly, I was introduced to a whole variety of food culture culture that was existing uh, in New Jersey. And then from there, uh, I got a job uh, and I worked for the New York Times for, for, for a bunch of years covering Jersey. Uh, and I, again, got to travel through all the 21 counties and continue that tradition of finding the best quick bite to eat or the best uh, overnight spot uh, to, to, to have a meal. And I really continued to realize just how diverse New Jersey is, not only culturally, but certainly through our food. I'm going to read you something in, in, in just a minute that comes from the book, but um, what what really struck me um, in, in going out there and going out into New Jersey and going out into um, these far flung places, a lot of times we just stay in our own town or our own county or even our, our, our own region. Um, I was really just sort of struck by the diversity of it. Um, so. As I continued to, in my writing career, I transitioned into the beer industry and started writing about the beer industry, which is which is booming and, and, and a lot of fun to cover. Uh, and I wrote this book called The American Craft Beer Cookbook, which came out in 2013. And Story Publishing, uh, which is based in North Adams, Massachusetts, published the book. And they had this existing series of cookbooks that they would call Dishing Up. And they had Dishing Up Maine, which was all seafood. And they had Dishing Up Minnesota, which was a lot of uh, hearty Midwestern dishes. And they did Vermont. And Maryland, which again was a lot of farms and, and seafood and crab and stuff like that. And I said to them, I would really like to do the Dishing Up New Jersey book. And they laughed at me. And I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, I want to do a Dishing Up New Jersey book because we really are the best food state. And it took some really hard convincing to, to let them, uh, you know, let me write this book. And I'm so glad that they did because I really consider this a love letter to the state uh, that I love so much and I'm sure that you all love uh, equally. And so I'd like to just read a, an essay that's in the front of the book to sort of sum up my feelings about New Jersey and New Jersey food. Pride. If you're from Jersey, it's what you have. If you're not from here, 
It's the attitude you pick up within minutes from Garden State natives. Long the butt of national jokes, the insufferable what exit questions, the armpit of America references, teasing about the smells, the mob, the traffic, the cities, party kids down the shore, and our endless stream of indicted politicians. We've heard it all and worse, but we endure because we know better. We know that there is more to the state than the view from the airport, the parkway tolls, the turnpike traffic, and the occasional patches of blight. We know that our shoreline is unrivaled and that our farms produce some of the most flavorful fruits and vegetables anywhere on the planet. Throughout the state, we hunt and fish. We can hike through a stretch of the Appalachian Trail or visit historic sites like the where Washington crossed the Delaware. We can do this while snapping along to Sinatra and rocking out to Springsteen. We're a complicated state, split into sections that are often tough to unify culturally, geographically, and societally. And when it comes to sports, the northern part roots for the Giants and Jets, which, though they play, practice, and keep offices here in New Jersey, identify with New York. The southern half bleeds green for the Eagles of Philadelphia, a city that rarely shows its eastern neighbor any love. In the spring and summer, we may root for the Yankees or Mets or Phillies, but we also catch minor league games at the dozen or so parks spread across the state. Our last proud-to-be-in-Jersey team is the Devils. We love them for bringing home the Stanley Cup and for their mascot, the legendary creature of New Jersey history. And because New Jersey is all about the lore, we're about the mysterious. Hell, there's even a magazine that celebrates our weirdness. It's the food, however, that truly unites us. A quality meal is never hard to find. Whether you're on the highways winding through cities and past factories and infrastructure and swamplands, or on the back roads, passing through bucolic towns, shore communities, forests, or farmlands, you're guaranteed to find a great restaurant serving up recipes that represent the very best of the Garden State. And this includes everything from cultural dishes with roots in Italy, Poland, Portugal, Ireland, China, in tomato, corn, cranberry, blueberry, and apple crops. There are also bison farms, bee farms, wineries, breweries, distilleries, and artists and producers of all manners of food. From fine dining to food trucks, we have it all. And while we love fresh, we also don't mind indulging in fried food and sweet treats now and again. What else are you gonna eat on the boardwalk? For us, quick is not a bad thing either. Corner bodegas are great for a snack or a sandwich in a pinch. A diner resplendent in chrome, mirrors, and formica can serve up an awesome food at lightning pace. Breakfast is served all day long. So this book is a celebration of all of that. It's about the people, the towns, and the food that make Jersey what it is, a place to be proud of. So I started working, as I mentioned, as a reporter when I was 16, and over the last two decades, I've been able to travel through all 21 counties covering the news of the day, the trends, and the residents, and I've never missed an opportunity to try the local specialty. So the book is a collection of recipes that come from restaurants and home kitchens all across Jersey. There are familiar diner dishes and shore specialties, fine dining options and deep fried goodies, and farm bounty and melting pot traditions. And here's the thing, and it's difficult during COVID right now, but I hope that you will visit these places in person. Get in the car, explore, eat like a local, and you might be surprised at what you find. And most of all, stand tall. Be a good steward for our beloved state. There's more for visitors than the view from Newark Airport, and there's no need to cross the Hudson or Delaware to visit those major cities. New Jersey will win you over, win over your heart through your stomach and we'll always do it with pride. There's this, <laughs> pride is, is, is something that really came through as I was talking to chefs, uh, putting this book together and, 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 and sort of putting things, um, uh, uh, putting recipes together for the book. And I wanna talk about the seasonality of our state in, in just a moment. Um, but I'm wondering if we could just put up that first poll question right now, uh, because I think it really does sort of play into where our prides lie. You guys able to do that?
Aha. So this is the question is, uh, what do you think is the most famous Jersey food, which we could also substitute out to what is your most favorite Jersey food? And we have uh, four options here. We have a uh, pork roll and Taylor ham, which I imagine will be a question that'll come up at some point, tomatoes, corn, or bagels. And while folks are doing that, we're headed into a fun part of the, uh, of the growing season here in Jersey. I, I bet a lot of folks have tomato plants in the ground. We're eagerly anticipating uh, the, um, eagerly anticipating the tomatoes that are gonna be coming our way uh, in just a few weeks and the corn that'll come our way just a few weeks after that. Um, and seasonality, I just wanna you know, talk about how uh, Jersey is the garden state for a reason. Uh, once you can get beyond the cities and congested roadways, it is so easy to find a garden or a farm. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, well, well where are they? Right now, the state has more than 9,000 farms covering more than 720,000 acres. And oh, here we go. The poll results, tomatoes are the uh, the the by far the favorite. And I, I don't know if I would disagree with any of these. Uh, any of these answers, but I'm certainly not surprised by by the Jersey tomatoes being as popular there as, as they are. And then obviously pork roll and Taylor ham, and then corn comes in, and then uh, bagels, lowly, lowly bagels uh, at at the end of it. Um, I'm also curious as to what you think might be uh, a famous Jersey food that I might have listed, and you can leave that uh, in the comments section or the chat section or the uh, the the question uh, section if if you would like to join in on that conversation. But Right now, as I was saying, we have 9,000 farms, more than 9,000 farms on more than 720,000 acres. And agriculture in the state is a multi-billion dollar business that encompasses not only produce, uh, but an equine industry, dairy farms, and nursery plants. Uh, right now, New Jersey is among the top national producers of several crops and not be number one uh, in numbers. Anybody who has had New Jersey corn, which is ninth in the nation with 68.4 million pounds produced. Tomato is seventh in the nation with 56.7 million pounds produced. Blueberries are fifth in the nation with 51.5 million pounds produced. And cranberries, uh, we're the third largest uh, producer in the nation with more than 55, 555, sorry, 550,000 barrels uh, that we've produced um, over the last, I guess, annually, as it were. State is also a national leader in bell pepper, in spinach, peach, cucumber, squash, apple, and snap bean production, according to the State Department of Agriculture. And farming is the state's third largest industry. Uh, right now, Jersey farmers are producing more than 100 different kinds of vegetables and fruit. So if you have a chance to pick up the book, you'll see a chart from the Jersey Fresh Program, which is a division of the State Department of Agriculture. And uh, it'll have the key harvest dates for the fruits, vegetables, and herbs that grow in the gardens and farms uh, from the north to the south. And obviously, we know that fresh produce tastes best when it's in season. So it's you know best to always mark your calendar and when it's time, head out to your local farmer's market or roadside stand to celebrate the best of spring, summer, and fall. And everybody can learn more by going to jerseyfresh.nj.gov. And what was interesting to me is that tomato answer. I'm always surprised with how much we love our tomatoes and how willing so many of us are uh, in the colder months to put up with those bland, uh, wet, sort of pink cardboard tasting slices that come on on burgers or in sandwiches uh, when tomatoes aren't in season. And I'm even more surprised when I go to, to, to restaurants in the state during the summer months uh, that are still using uh, tomatoes that have been shipped in from other states or grown in hot houses and are just bland and flavorless. Um, I think one of the things that we are known for is speaking our minds and speaking up. And I've had so many conversations with chefs where I've politely said, you know, hey, it's tomato season. How come this tomato looks terrible on my sandwich? Um, you know, and they, they've slowly started to change. And I think that if, if, if we want to eat better, um, you know, these are conversations worth having. Um, so are there any questions yet? I guess not. All right, so the question tab is open. Oh. Yeah, there's a few questions that came in. Oh, okay. Yeah, just, go for it. 
Can you see them or no? I uh, know I can't. Okay. Um, so this is that's good. This is this is more exciting that way. If I if I saw the questions, I'd have a heads up. But now it's like lightning round answer and doing sure. it without a net. Um, this is from referring to the poll before a hot take. New Jersey bagels are better than New York City bagels. They are. Um, Everything in New Jersey is better than New York, and 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 and, and or any other state. I I, I will say. Um, Trenton tomato pie is a favorite of ours, says Bridget. Yeah, and that's such a regional thing where you know you can get it in parts of I guess Trenton and certainly down in in, in Atlantic City in various uh, uh, pizzerias that are known for it. Um, it's not as popular up in the north, and it's it's a very sort of regional thing. Next one. Moment. Um, we have a diner in Keyport, New Jersey. Has been there for decades. Have you ever been to Keyport? Do a lot of eating places have their own areas to eat out in? Uh, I imagine I've been to the diner in Keyport at some point. It's not uh, necessarily jumping to the top of my mind. Uh, you know, I mean, there's certainly uh, iconic diners like the TikTok on Route 3 uh, up, up north. And there's, uh, um, but diners are so personal for us in New Jersey. Uh, where I grew up in South Orange and Maplewood, we had a couple of diners nearby. And my particular group of friends, we preferred to go to the Sage Diner. And we had other groups of friends that preferred to go to Huck Finn or go to the Broadway Diner and Summit or, you know, a, a few others. There, there's something very personal about having uh, diner options and whether it's you like uh, what they're putting out baked good wise or they make a better Taylor ham, egg and cheese sandwich than a, a, another place that doesn't suit your taste quite as much or uh, you know, they have good soup specials or, or, you know, it's just down, down the block from you and proximity is king. Um, Diners, it's not as easy as like a McDonald's, right? Where you go to a McDonald's, you know exactly what you're going to get. Um, but they're everywhere, just like McDonald's, especially in the state. And so, so what I found, um, there are so many great, um, great options out there, and there's endless choice. And it's it's sort of like Cinderella slipper. Uh, you can find a diner that fits you perfectly, and it's probably not going to be too far from your house. Um, as far, what was the the, the question about eating out? Do a lot of places have an option to eat out, like outside, I would think? Yeah, I well, so this is the interesting thing in the age of COVID right now. People are scrambling to 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 figure out um, if if we continue with this 50% capacity, you know, if a restaurant could fit 100 people uh, at, at a seating, now they can only do 50, um, and that's going to impact their bottom line. And so... I, what I've been seeing over the last couple of weeks is people trying to figure out outdoor dining options and whether that is uh, putting up uh, like party tents, like you might see at an outdoor wedding in their parking lots uh, and then doing additional seating out there. Uh, where I live in Middlesex County right now, there is a uh, a restaurant that was next to a dry cleaner that happens to have a parking lot that doesn't get used all that much. And so the dry cleaner said, hey, uh, you know, you're our neighbor. We have this outdoor space. You don't have any outdoor space. Uh, let's spruce it up and you can now have more outside seating. And so it's neighbors helping neighbors. But uh, restaurants are really getting creative right now about uh, how they can bring people back in a safe way, um, but also continue to, to make money to pay the mortgage and to, to, to keep employees paid. Uh, paid. Diners, it's, it's, diners are, are going to be tough uh, because, you know, they do have those parking lots and they might set up outside, but uh, oftentimes they are in small footprints that don't uh, have a lot of outdoor space to them. Um, but I do think that we'll see uh, an uptick in to-go orders and certainly th these last few months, um, uh, restaurants have really gotten creative with how they um, get food out the door and whether or not it's changing up specials every day like they would uh, or offering uh, boxes or packs of, of easy, you know, easy dinners or easy lunches. There's a, a restaurant not far from my house that's been doing Taco Tuesday kits where it's enough to feed a family of four for two nights, essentially. But it's everything that you would need to build tacos at home. Uh, and because you can also now do um, uh, alcohol to go, you could also get a, a margarita um, uh, delivered to you curbside. And it's in a closed closed pack but it's it's still um uh interesting times with a lot of outdoor options these days 
Were there other questions? Or is that it for uh, the moment? What's the original pork roll and where is it from? Taylor, Case, et cetera? Uh, so uh, Taylor goes back in time um, and, you know, it, it's the whole argument about a Taylor ham uh, is versus pork roll is that it, it, it's the John Taylor ham company. Um, which is pork roll. Like if you read the if you, if you read the label, it does say uh, pork roll on it. Um, and it, it's sort of one of these. It's a regional thing where um, uh, up north we were just used to referring to it as Taylor ham uh, while we were eating pork roll uh, the the entire time. Pork roll as the product we were eating the John Taylor ham brand, and it was just easier to say Taylor ham uh, as opposed to Case, uh, which you know has always just called itself. Uh, pork roll uh, as, as well. So the 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 interesting thing though is that it, it really is sort of this regional dialect, um, but they are two very different flavors and they do play regionally very different as well. Uh, Case has a little bit more, in my opinion, of like a gamey, um, uh, meatier flavor to it, uh, whereas uh, John Taylor ham has uh, a little bit more of a spicy. Uh, note to it uh, and has a little bit more of a uh, almost like a bacon and a sausage uh, mix mixed together. Um, but so much of it depends on where I think you were raised in the state and what you grabbed to cook on Sunday mornings. And as long as you were notching it properly, um, I think I think you're 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 pretty OK. Um, but yeah, it's it's the it, it it is very much a regional product. Um, you don't often see a lot of it, even if you go across any of the rivers. You don't see it in in, in New York restaurants, uh, or even uh, the further up you get in the Hudson Valley, uh, you're not seeing it in Delaware. You're not seeing it in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, certainly as you get into Pennsylvania, you're getting into Scrapple territory, which uh, I know parts of the state down in Camden County, near Philly or near Delaware, uh, are big fans of Scrapple. I've never understood the appeal uh, of that particular uh, breakfast meat, but um, uh, it's it, 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 it's all regional, as it were. All right, um, Deborah says I always judge my diner based upon corned beef hash. Yeah, boy, that's a yeah, because you can tell if they're using the real thing or if they're using the can thing. And or the, the the canned products, and I think that's great. And it's also you know how good they can they can uh, make the eggs over easy uh, on top of it as well. Uh, but but uh, but I'm with you. Good corned beef hash, and we have a recipe actually for it in the book, uh, which is worth checking out because it's uh, it's so easy to make. And um, uh, if you let it cook just a little long, you get some of those those burnt bits on the end, and uh, it gets a little tough. And it's um, uh, it's a delight to eat. Right. Uh, what are your favorite towns for having the best restaurants in the state? Oh, boy. So um, restaurants are tough, um, but I think like eating towns, uh, places that you can go and get universally good food uh, is is that 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 to me is, is is what I seek out. And so first and foremost, and, and yes, I'm biased uh, because I grew up there, uh, but South Orange in Essex County has the best food scene in the state. Uh, not only do we have uh, the wonderful Sunny's bagels, uh, which I think are are just you know they're they're perfect. They're 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 boiled. They're baked the way that they should. Um, you know they use a really nice yeast culture. They have a uh, which is you know, benefit of that that yeast culture being in the same place for uh, gosh you know 50 years now or so or, or or longer. Maybe it might be 70 years at this point. And um, their bagels are just excellent. So that that that's for breakfast. And then uh, Gaslight is the brewery in town uh, where you go for the burger. Uh, they've won multiple awards in the state for having some of the best hamburgers, and uh, and and it's with with good reason. It's not too thick a burger. It's not too thin. But the meat blend is really well done. Uh, all of the other ingredients are fresh along with it. Uh, and there's just there's a little something to it that just uh, brings it out. Um, but in in my mind, what makes South Orange the, the best food town uh, is because it's the home of the Town Hall Deli, which is the creator of the Sloppy Joe sandwich. And if you're on this webinar right now and you're immediately thinking of ground beef and tomato sauce, I'm going to politely ask you to log off uh, and go question your life choices. Um, 
obviously this the sloppy joe sandwich uh is a triple decker uh meat and cheese coleslaw russian dressing on rye bread sandwich and it is it's 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 interesting it has this, this great history the deli's been around for 100 years or so and um uh it it has roots in havana uh, Cuba. So the 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 founder of of the deli had gone to Cuba. Uh, he had had a sandwich at Sloppy Joe's, which is the bar that you can still go to. There's one in Key West as well that sort of mimics that. Um, but the the sandwich he came back and he he put it together and they became famous for it. And it's usually two meats. It's a cheese uh, and like I say, coleslaw and Russian dressing. They do everything in house. Everything is sliced thin. Everything is sliced perfect. Um, and it is a sandwich unlike anything else. And again, it's sort of this regional thing um, because you can get turkey on rye with Russian and coleslaw pretty much anywhere in, in, in the state, but to construct a sandwich the way that they do, and the Milburn Deli also does one. Uh, it's not as good, in my opinion. The people of Milburn strongly disagree with me. Um, There's a guy in the ledger who wrote a story recently who thought that the Milburn Deli was, was better. Uh, he was clearly wrong in his reporting and execution. Um, but uh, that sandwich has become famous, I think, the world over, and it's been featured in uh, lots of television shows. They're now shipping all across the country. They use a, a service where they pack it, I guess, on dry ice, and they, and they send it out there. And I have a friend of mine who I grew up with who's living in, in San Francisco right now, and um, uh, he gets one every year sent to him for his birthday. And you know, he says it's 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 the best best day of his uh, uh, of his life every year is when he gets to have that that particular sandwich. So um, South Orange, I think, is a great food town. Uh, Asbury Park has really come up in the last couple of years. Um, they they have such great diversity, and they're really sort of pushing pushing culinary food traditions. Uh, everything from uh, Thai to Italian to the Asbury beer garden, yeah, the Asbury beer garden, which is there, which has this really sort of fun fusion food that they're putting out where they're, they're taking uh, standard seafood recipes, but sort of melding them with some German traditions as well. Um, Asbury park, I think is, 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 is really quite wonderful. Uh, Metuchen in Middlesex County has really grown in the last couple of years. Uh, they have some really great food options that are out there a, a, as well. Uh, Jersey city, where I used to live, has also really come a long way as far as concept dining in Plaza, which is the pizzeria there that's right across from City Hall on Newark Avenue, uh, has been voted, it was in the New York Times, Pete Wells did this, uh, voted uh, the best pizzeria uh, in the region. And I think the, the Times snarky headline was, um, uh, New York's best pizzeria is in New Jersey. Uh, but it's absolutely true. Uh, he has studied the art of pizza making there, uh, he brought in a specialty oven, uh, the owner did, and uh, they only make a certain amount of pies every day. And so once it's done, it's done. And so he has measured out his ingredients to say, okay, I can make 70 pies a day, and these are going to be 70 perfect pies because that's what we have the bandwidth for. And it's absolutely brilliant if you're if you're able to have uh, that particular pizza. Uh, but certainly, I, you know, I think anywhere that you go in the state, you're going to be able to find food that resonates with you um, or something that is different. Um, you know, obviously, if you're up in the Clifton area, you can go to uh, Rutt's Hut. Uh, if you're out in Buttsville, you can go to Hot Dog Johnny's. Uh, there, there, there's there's so much uh, out there. And a lot of the time, it's these small mom and pop shops that um, are serving up, you know, great food traditions. And before we get to some other questions, I just kind of wanted to talk about tradition, because as I was putting this book together, I spent a lot of time talking with chefs and home cooks asking about recipes that that we were thinking about putting in the book and the question that i'd always ask is where did this come from and almost universally the answer was well this is something that my mom used to make or my grandfather used to make or my grandmother used to make or my dad used to make um or you know this recipe has been to my family forever and i've modified it over the years but uh you know this is this very much makes me think of home this very much makes me think of of, of growing up uh, you know in, in in a particular place and in a particular time and that to me really just shows the community of food and how important it is that we we break bread together because if if you have grandparents that make the same recipes or made the same recipes when you'd go over for sunday dinner or you'd get together on on certain holidays we remember the food 
but it's almost secondary to us coming together and the hopefully warm feeling that we're having of family and community and togetherness and the food is what brings us all to the table and the food is nourishing and the food makes us feel uh, feel good and taste good um, but it, 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 it's the memories that are associated with it and those traditions of every year, you know, we're going to have uh, tomato aspic, uh, you know, for Christmas dinner or every year we're going to have, uh, you know, Yorkshire pudding with Christmas dinner um, or, you know, every year on, on St. Patrick's Day, we're going to make uh, this family recipe soda bread. And uh, in fact, one of the handouts is a soda bread recipe that my mom got when she was very young and lived in the Bronx and she got it from a neighbor and she uh, would, would make it and bring it to, to family parties and it became you know, known as her soda bread and people would clamor for it. People would say, you know, oh, you know, could you make me some or could I have that recipe? And that's really, I think, the ultimate compliment of when you're with somebody and you're, you're, you're eating their food that you want to have the recipe because you know not only does it taste good but it's going to make you remember uh, good memories and then you can share that with other people as well and so th this book is really a collection of people shared collective memories of food nourishing them and sustaining them um, while also tasting good along the way and so um, I hope you have a chance to to try that and to make that Irish soda bread and to to share it with people when we're all able to be out and uh, to be sharing again. Um, I guess we can put up the other, the next poll question. So, and I should point out, what is the highest grossing uh, agricultural product? And uh, there's four options there, cranberry, turnip, blueberry, or tomato. And while we wait uh, for that, I will point out that the other recipe that we have in the handout is a rosemary citrus soda. And this is something that you can all make at home. It's just a very simple syrup that you can make with sugar and water and adding uh, some, obviously some citrus to it. And then if you have rosemary growing in your garden right now, uh, you can add that to it as well for, for some garnish. So you're getting a little bit of that uh, spicy herbal bite, a little bit of that uh, orangey zest, a little bit of sweetness. And then you just start off with some seltzer, uh, just some, some club soda, some bubbly water. Uh, if you want to add something else to it, if you're over 21, you're more than welcome to. But uh, it's really just a nice, fun, refreshing uh, drink to have that is fairly easy to make and, and, and keeps for, for a good couple of days. And as we're headed into the warm weather, uh, I find that that is one of those um, – one of those dishes that I just kind of keep going back to and have a picture of uh, in, in, in the fridge for, for a nice weekend afternoon. Let's see, did that poll come back? Wow. All right. So cranberry, turnip, blueberry, tomato. Uh, the state over or everybody in the room overwhelmingly thought at 43% that it was cranberry. Uh, it is not. Um, uh, and I was surprised by that as well. Uh, it's actually blueberry which uh, had, did about $50 million worth of, worth of business uh, uh, last year. Uh, cranberry comes in just slightly, slightly less of that uh, uh, these days. But blueberry is the highest grossing agricultural product in the state, according to a recent uh, agricultural poll that came out. What, what's interesting was, um, and I talked about this in the, in the intro, uh, you know, blueberries, uh, we're not number one. Uh, in 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 the country, we we used to be um, a, a long time ago. We were we were a blueberry state, uh, and we got eclipsed by Florida of all places. And what's really interesting is the University of Florida Florida has an agricultural program uh, that is working to build uh, or to grow products and and produce that. Uh, previously were unable to grow there and blueberries did not like the the Floridian uh, climate uh, the scientists found a way and the agricultural uh, scientists found a way uh, to change that and now uh, Florida is one of the highest uh, producing blueberry states and uh, a lot of the ones that we get uh, in the winter and in some of the the off months are are being grown down in the sunshine state uh, which is which is kind of weird um they're trying to do some other stuff as well. They're trying to do that with uh, with hops, uh, which which is an ingredient in beer, uh, uh, which 
don't grow in that climate as well. Um, and they're having some early luck um, uh, through the University of Florida. Uh, it is worth noting that uh, tomatoes, which I'm surprised only got 29%, uh, there are so many cool varieties of tomatoes coming out of the Rutgers uh, Agricultural Station. Uh, they have a whole tomato breeding program. Uh, you can go to their website, which is so much fun to look at, and you can actually buy seedlings uh, or seeds to grow all uh, any number of I think they have something like 50 50 or 60 70 might even be more uh, varieties of tomatoes that just go beyond Roma or beefsteak or tomatoes on the vine that that, that we normally see uh, I'm growing something called purple Cherokee uh, this summer just to kind of see what it's like but the um, the possibilities are endless and it, it's a lot of fun to see uh, what food scientists uh, are reviving, are bringing back, are creating uh, to really bring some flavor back to our to our produce. Um, before I get to the next part, I guess I should ask if there are any other questions. All right, yeah, we have a few coming in. Um, okay. I grew up I grew up in South Jersey. Since I moved to Metuchen, I can't find a good cheesesteak. Any thoughts on where the best cheesesteak north of Princeton is? Uh, the best cheesesteak north of Princeton. Uh, I normally would have sent you to the grease trucks, but uh, Rutgers, you know, in their infinite wisdom, uh, got got rid of those. Um, I'm I'm a big fan. I, I guess the question was from a touch-in as well. Uh, there's a place called Sub Place Better. Uh, which is on Main, Main Street in Metuchen, which I think does a really decent uh, cheesesteak. And it, 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 I guess it comes down to, you know, what is it that you're looking for in a cheesesteak? Because that is actually one of those things where it's so much fun to replicate that at home, um, to, to, to make a cheesesteak at home. Um, there is a, you know, because then you can actually use the ratio of things that you want. Some people like it with mushrooms. Some people like it, you know, with uh, with provolone. Some people like it with whiz. Some people, it, it, so you can actually, you know, uh, uh, do it yourself. But I've found uh, that Subplace Better in Metuchen does a uh, a pretty good cheesesteak. I'm trying to think if anything else comes to mind. That's not something that I often get, but it's, um, when I do, I get it from there. Uh, with so many farms and restaurants to choose from, how did you choose the ones highlighted in your book? Oh, they're the ones who said yes. Uh, <laughs> no, um, you know, it, it, it is so hard to choose. And the problem with doing a book like this is is the questions or the comments that usually come my way. If people say, well, why didn't you put this in there? Boy, it's a real miss that you didn't, uh, you know, talk to talk to these people. And, and, and I agree with you. Um, you know, I, I tried to get as, as much of a cross-section as I could. I wanted all 21 counties represented. Uh, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just, uh, you know, farms and fine dining, but I really wanted to get the roadside stands or some of the diners or, uh, you know, some of the places that are doing, um, you know, more of the junk food type aspect as well. Um, and, and some places, I thought it was really important to highlight places that weren't an obvious pick for a cookbook you know because maybe they didn't have the aesthetics or maybe uh you know their their owners or chefs weren't the type who would be showing up on a food network competition because uh they they lack the necessary personality skills for for such things but i thought that to, to get a true representation of the state uh that i needed to be as diverse as possible and and, and i know uh, that i've left some folks behind and that's why we can always do a volume two of the book so if you have suggestions uh please shoot me a note um, this is uh, somebody following up with the the keyport question, just saying we have three sure. bars in three bars in town that have courtyards. The diner I was talking about is the Broad Street Diner. Originally, it was called the Seaport Diner on Broad Street. So cool! I got to get down there and check them out once uh, once we're all. I guess we're able to leave our houses now. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm jonesing for for a good diner visit. So I appreciate the recommendation and uh, got to get got to get myself to Keyport. All right. Uh, what's on the menu for dinner in the whole household tonight? Uh, that's a great question. I think we're just doing something easy like burgers on the grill. Uh, last night I made pesto with uh, with basil from the garden, which was which was a lot of fun. And uh, I've been I've been gearing up to to write a a, a new cookbook that's going to be in the beer space again. So I've been sort of fooling around and uh, experimenting with stuff. But um, earlier this week we did uh, some some plantains and uh, some fried plantains, some 
uh, red pickled onions and a little bit of microgreens on top of tortillas, and uh, that was a really fun combination for uh, for a little lunchtime taco. And I've been I've been making that a lot recently, just because um, uh, we've been able to get a good amount of plantains, which is which is a lot of fun to a lot of fun to cook with. All right. Uh, could you mention Silk City Diners? Is there still any original ones left, and do you have a favorite? Silk City Diners. You know, I, I don't know enough about them, uh, and I don't know if there are any left. You know, the, 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 the interesting thing is there are so many – and this was, this was a fun part of researching the book – was that there are so many uh, things that have come and gone uh, over – over time that we remember from our childhood or that we remember our parents telling us or our grandparents telling us uh, that sort of become part of the national consciousness. And then, you know, things kind of get rolled over um, a little bit. Uh, you know, we, we've obviously seen the rise of the strip malls in New Jersey. We've obviously seen uh, the, the rise of fast casual and takeouts, which has sort of replaced uh, some of the, um, you know, some of the food traditions that were there. Uh, you know, large corporations that own places like Red Lobster and Applebee's and et cetera, et cetera, uh, they have a, sometimes an easier time operating uh, and paying their bills uh, because they are the size of the company that they are than some small mom and pop shops. Um, and so there's these things that exist in our minds and that exist in our memories, um, and some have held on, uh, but a lot of the time, you know, they they, they don't. And that's it, it's such a frustrating thing for folks, but it's also part of the restaurant industry um, that things, you know, are not always designed to live forever. And sometimes, you know, that it's it's best that they don't. Um, if if you think about this this New York Times review that happened of Peter Luger's The Steakhouse, which has been revered for, for so long, but a recent review uh, really just put it through the meat grinder in a, in, in a terrible way. And it sort of changed the perspective of, you know, well, sure, this place has been around for 150 years, but, you know, does that mean that it's still good? Um, and, and I think that, that that's an important thing to sort of remember with our food traditions is that, um, you know, they might be great when they're kids, when we're kids, or they might be great at a, at a certain time and people get tired or people retire or new people come in um, and you're expecting something to taste one way and they've changed it up. Um, suddenly those memories are marred um, a, 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 a little bit. And so um, I, I'm actually a big proponent of things living in our memories uh, happily as opposed to being crushed in reality sometimes when it when it when it comes to food um just before we continue though i just wanted to talk a little bit about uh covid and because this sort of fits into what i was just ta talking about I know these last four months have been incredibly difficult for everybody and it's it, it's certainly uh been, been the case uh with, with with my family but what i've realized is there's been a real, if there's a good thing that's come out of this, is that for a lot of folks, there's been a return to home and a return to focusing on things that really matter and things that we really care about. And as the shutdown started happening, we started seeing local restaurants, local mom and pops saying, you know, hey, we need your help. You know, hey, like we we want to stay and serve Main Street. Hey, we want to stay and serve serve this town. Um, we can only do it through your support. And people stepped up. And rather than going to the Applebee's or rather than going to the Red Lobsters, and I know that our neighbors and our friends, you know, work there, um, but the corporate offices is, is, is what I'm talking about. Um, you know, keeping you know, brick and mortar Main Street uh, restaurants open uh, has been it it's been wonderful to see people doing curbside, people doing takeout, uh, and and people really remembering and beating who their local business owners are uh, in town uh, through through all of this. And I've also started to see uh, and, and been talking with folks, and if you're on Instagram or Facebook or anything, you've, you've obviously seen an uptick uh, in what people are cooking at home and what they're making at home. And people are going back into family recipes and remembering, you know, boy, you know, my grandmother used to make this and it used to take all afternoon. And, uh, you know, I haven't had the time, but now suddenly I do because I don't have a commute. And so I'm going to I'm going to make this recipe again. I know my wife has been doing that with her mother. Uh, they've been going through the family cookbook and just making stuff and, and and things that they haven't tasted in 20 or 30 years. And the stories that come out of that as well of, you know, well, this this was your Aunt Marion. And, you know, she uh, she used to do this and she had this funny tick. And, you know, it, it, these conversations conversations uh, that, that come up, again, go beyond the food themselves. And so if there's any good 
that's come from COVID, and and believe me, I know that there's there's very very little. Um, it, it might be that we have really thought about how we can support local restaurants, but that how also we can continue to uh, keep our food traditions alive. Um, I know we're getting towards the end, so I, I don't want to leave any questions behind. If there are, if there are anybody, sure. Um, are there identifiers in the book to identify restaurants with specific dietary considerations, such as vegan or gluten-free offerings? Uh, probably. Uh, it's been it's been a few years since I wrote the book, and I'd have to go through a copy of it. Um, yeah, there are gluten-free recipes, there are vegetarian, vegan recipes in there. Uh, not as many, uh, uh, but uh, certainly I wanted to get uh, those options in uh, into this book because I know that that's an important thing for for dietary restrictions. And you know, I mean, th these days you can call uh, pretty much any place that you're going to, and obviously you know that they'll um, uh, they'll they'll answer that. But um, yeah, there are there are uh, some options in the book. Uh, in, in, in both of those categories. What seashore town should you visit for the best seafood dinner? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, and one I'm going to punt on uh, because I don't know. Uh, you know, because again, it, it, it comes down to, um, you know, it, it comes down to memories and it comes down to, um, you know, places that, that sort of, you know, uh, speak to you. I would probably say Cape May, uh, just because it has, uh, not only is it a fun place to visit and it's, you know, obviously a you know, fishing town, uh, but it also has a wide variety of restaurants. So you can have your fine dining, you can have your shacks, you can have, um, you know, your, your, your clam bakes and your lobster, but also, you know, just your, your typical fish fry. Um, so I would probably say Cape May, but I'm sure that there are people who would wildly disagree with me. And that's the beauty of our state. All right. Uh, somebody has a comment that Hamilton is the blueberry capital of the world. Okay. Cool. I got to I <laughs> got to get back down to Hamilton. Um, Somebody asked, uh, do you have other recipes in the book, such as, I guess, out of sight of the two that were in the handout, maybe? Oh, yeah, there, there's like 100 plus recipes in the book. Okay. Yeah, there's there there's there's a lot of recipes. So uh, in fact, you know, some of them are some of them are goofy. Um, the very first recipe. So there's a breakfast chapter, there's soups and stews. There's a farm, see, um, and, it's, and it's grouped like that. Uh, there's desserts, there's cocktails uh, in, in the back as well that celebrate a lot of Jersey produce. Um, but the very first recipe in the breakfast chapter is a buttered roll, which is, as we all know, two ingredients. It's a roll with butter. And the publisher fought me on it. And they said, you know, we, we can't have this. This is barely a recipe. And I said, yeah, but it, it's, it's, it's a Jersey thing. Like, you, you, you have to understand that. And I said, why are we going to waste a page and waste ink? And I, and I had to explain to them that there is no way that I would have any credibility with this book uh, if the first recipe in the breakfast chapter was not a simple buttered roll, which has been the staple of so many of us uh, on our commutes where we grab a coffee, we grab a buttered roll, we eat it in the car on the way to work. Um, yes, it's easier to have somebody else make it for you and pick it up on a counter. But I wanted to, you know, really show, um, you know, how diverse Jersey is and how simple Jersey can be as well and, and still taste good. So yeah, there's there's a hundred plus recipes in the book that um, uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to, to check out and taste and enjoy. All right. Uh, what are some of the best high end restaurants in the state? Oh man. So I used to have an answer for this. Uh, and now I have a three-year-old. And so I haven't been out, uh, to a high-end restaurant in New Jersey, uh, or anywhere for that matter, uh, for the better part of three and a half years now. So what I would say is what Eric Levin and his team is doing at New Jersey Monthly, uh, is worth checking into because he really has his finger on the pulse there. And, uh, it's a great magazine, a great local magazine to support as well. But their dining section, I think, uh, uh, really nails the the, the high end stuff. And it's it's just, it's not. It, I, I'm trying not to make this a cop out answer. I just um, literally have not been at a at a quiet restaurant uh, with my wife in in quite some time. Now I need uh, to remedy that. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite restaurant? 
what is my favorite restaurant? So I used to I used to have some answers for this, uh, and then uh, they have they they have since closed. Um, I'm partial to Gaslight in South Orange, like I mentioned before, just because I've been going there for so long, and I I know the owners, and I know the food is always going to be good, and I can always uh, uh, go and get together with friends. Um, you know, these days uh, there's a there's a place not far from my house called uh, Woodstack, which is a pizzeria, uh, which I think is not only doing some really great pizzas, but is also doing um, uh, some some really wonderful sides. They have some uh, Brussels sprouts that they do with honey and spices that are just just killer to to die for. So um, yeah, we've we've been going there uh, a lot more these days. But um, yeah, as far as a, a traditional go to restaurant, it'd probably be Gaslight in South Orange. But um, I'm open to finding something new. Um, this is just a comment. Some other towns with great restaurants are Red Bank. Hoboken and Newark's Ironbound. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all three of those, and I should have mentioned those early on, but Red Bank has really come around in the last couple of years, and it's been a lot of fun uh, going there. And um, uh, I have family who lives there, and uh, my parents actually, and uh, we've been we've been checking out some of those restaurants in Red Bank. And Hoboken has certainly had a lot of great food for a really long time, and uh, it, it continues to get better. Uh, again, uh, I think after I turned 35 uh, a couple of years ago, um, the the allure of going out into Hoboken for for all nighters. Uh, sort of dissipated a little bit, and so uh, I haven't been to to Hoboken quite as much, even though uh, my sister and brother-in-law live there. Um, and then, uh, what was the third one as well? Oh, Newark's Ironbound, absolutely. So I have recipes from uh, from a couple of places in the Ironbound in the book. But yeah, that the, one of the last things that I'll say because I know we're running out of time is uh, go visit the cities. Don't be afraid of the cities. Um, you know, Patterson has a great restaurant scene. Trenton uh, it could be better, but it's you know there, there's some options there as well. You know, Atlantic City outside of the casinos, but even inside of the casinos uh, has some fun gems to it, um, and certainly. Certainly, Newark's Ironbound. Um, the, the the cool thing about this book uh, that I hope that I hope you'll 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 take away, and I mentioned this at the, at the start, really was um, uh, to get out and explore, to go find a different part of the state, to go take that unknown road, to to take an overnight trip to Cape May, or go out west to Hunterdon County, uh, and you know stay at a bed and breakfast out there, and go you know stay among the farms and you know eat local restaurants and everything. But um, yeah, there's no shortage of good food no matter where you go in the state, um, and we're easy enough to navigate, but it's so easy to get stuck in our own town and place. Um, that we don't necessarily thinking about vacationing in our own state or traveling in our own state for food, um, but we really should. All right. Um, are there any Mercer County restaurants you'd recommend or that you have recipes from? Uh, there are uh, some Mercer County recipes uh, in the book, and I'm struggling to remember right now what they might be. Uh, oh, from Cherry Grove Farm. I don't have a copy of the book in front of me, and I, I apologize for that. Um, but Cherry Grove Farm uh, down uh, just, just south of Princeton uh, is not only a fun place to visit, but there's a recipe in the book for them, and you should go and certainly eat their cheese. Uh, they're, they're making some of the, the country's finest cheese these days. All right. Um, somebody says, I agree with the Kate May answer, something for everyone, all styles of dining. Thank you. Uh, another one is, buttered roll is so Jersey. Come on, that is great. Tell the publisher I love it. That is so great. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, restaurants in Bergen County and hello from Oradell. Oh, hello from Oradell. Uh, Oradell is such is such a cool town, um, and uh, I, I got up there not too long ago, and uh, I, I love what they're doing there. There's a real sense of fun community that takes place in that town uh, through a lot of uh, the the charitable groups and and, and social groups as well. Um, fun restaurants in Bergen County. Boy, I'm being put on the spot right now. Something will come to me at some point, but right off the bat. Um, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I used to spend a lot of time in Bergen, and it's been a while since I've been up there. Sorry. All right, let's see. Um, hello from Montclair. Check out Ani Ramen, multiple sites. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's one in Jersey City. I think there's... Uh, 
uh, yeah, they're popping up all over the place. And, you know, that's sort of the fun thing. It's uh, the ramen places are becoming uh, the new food trend right now. And uh, it's it's pretty inventive and you get to taste some some you know, really fun uh uh, special flavors, uh, and people are getting really creative with it. But Ani Ramen, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a fan of for sure. All right. Uh, somebody says, thanks so much. This was a great presentation. Thank you. And I guess yeah, as Andrew, we... I'm... Sorry. I'm... Yeah, go ahead, John. You can finish. I just wanted to say thank you. And guys, really try to get that book because it's a great book. Uh, it's a fun book. And it it just gives you highlights of every county. He really covered the typical Jersey food as well as different diverse things that we would have in, as a melting pot. He covered diners. He really did cover diners. We've got boardwalk treats in there and you know he's got funnel cake and how to make a good funnel cake. Uh, who doesn't like that? Uh, just you know, don't breathe in too fast because you'll choke on the, on the uh, on the sugar on the, on the sugar. Yeah, yeah, I did that with a beignet <laughs> one. Um, so, you know, guys, and yes, it's on Amazon, but, you know, if you want to support your local businesses, I mean, sure, you can ask for it through the state library. But if you want to support your local businesses, go to that IndieBound.org site, look for a bookstore, and then you can go right to that bookstore and ask them if they have the book. They'll, you can see it. It really does not take long. It's a couple clicks, and you could have it. But it's a fun book. It's a good book. It has easy recipes. It has different recipes. And most of all, it's focused on New Jersey and its pride and what we have here and why we have a reason to be proud. So I just want to say that before we sign off and just thank you to everyone who participated and I'm telling you, I'm very impressed with you, John, with the lightning round and not being able to see the questions. So, uh, ooh, an Thank hour you. lightning round almost there. So that's my that was great. I'm going to bow yeah. out now. Thank you. Uh, I really, I really appreciate it, and and thanks to everybody who who logged on, and certainly thank you to the State Museum. Um, you know, it's so interesting how museum, uh, how uh, I'm sorry, State Library, and how libraries have. Um, you know, if, if you go back 15, 20 years as the internet started to take off and Amazon started to take off, it's like, oh, this is going to be the death of bookstores. This is going to be the death of libraries. Uh, that hasn't been the case. And certainly there are great bookstores throughout the state that you can go and support local uh, as well and get real recommendations from a real human who's going to uh, take time to listen to you and, and, and give you um, – uh, some fun recommendations. And the same thing is true with librarians. And the same thing is true with libraries that have changed in the last couple of years uh, to offer programs like this and to support authors, hopefully fun and, and informative talks um, so that it's not just picking up a book, bringing it home and bringing it back later on. Um, they become cultural hubs and they're necessary uh, in, in our towns. And so all of you who have logged on today uh, to support the library, thank you and please continue to do it. And when uh, COVID lifts, uh, I hope you'll continue to do it in person. So um, uh, thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for uh, showing your Jersey pride by showing up today. And I hope to see you all out in the world and I, I've gotten some good recommendations. I got to go to Keyport now and uh, check out the food scene there. So thank you for that recommendation and wish everybody good health and, and good eating. All right, uh, John, before we go, um, oh, yeah. uh, what is the book title again and is it available digitally? It is. It's called Dishing Up New Jersey and it's uh, recipes from the Garden State, but Dishing Up New Jersey is the name of the book and you can find it uh yeah it, it is available uh on the kindle format and all of the other uh e-readers as well and i think you can also get that through indie bound as well and i should point out that there's awesome photography in the book done by amy roth uh, who lives in the northern part of the state and uh, she's she's one of the country's great food photographers and and just a just a joy uh to work with but uh, she really brings these recipes to life that uh, had no specific food styling no uh, oils or smokes or anything else to make it look like uh, uh, look extra fancy this is all exactly how it was plated is how she shot it and um, hopefully it, it gets you excited to eat the dishes it certainly did for me all right well thanks john thank you everybody and be safe be well and we'll see you again next time thanks thanks so much